I'm not saying anything confusing, not confusing language. Why did you mention contradictory qualities like pure intelligence and again absence of consciousness? I three he asked. And this is Tankara commentary. Tajamal ke replies, I did not attribute them to the same entity. That's a beautiful thing. Not this limited entity, the unlimited entity. It is this limited entity that disappears and along with its consciousness. The unlimited, I never said so. You are confused, but I am going to clarify. It is you who through a mistake have taken one and the same entity to be possessed of contradictory attributes. I did not say this. What I said is this. When the individual existence of the self that is superimposed by ignorance and is connected with the body and organs is destroyed by knowledge, the particular consciousness connected with the body consisting of false notion that is destroyed under the destruction of the limiting adjuncts of the body, etc. Just like a pot is destroyed, the image in it also is destroyed. The truth is not destroyed. There is ever there the sun. But a part in which the reflected was there, that alone is destroyed. Reflection also is destroyed along with it. The light and vanish when the water and the light which form their support are gone. Water in a part, the sun reflected there, the part goes, reflection also goes. That's all what I said. But just as the sun, moon, etc., which are the realities behind the reflections, remain as they are, so that pure intelligence, which is the transcendent Brahman, remains unchanged. This has been referred to as pure intelligence, Shuddha, Shuddha Chit. It is the self of the whole universe and does not really pass out with the destruction of the elements. The whole world goes away, Brahman remains. From Brahman, the whole world has come. If the whole world goes away, Brahman cannot go away. It remains the same. But the individual existence of the elements get destroyed. But this is due to ignorance. Modifications are but near names and forms. This is the constant utterance in Vedanta. Nama and Rupa. Merely near appearance only. Just like gold. Make a bangle out of it. It is a Nama Rupa. You destroy the bangle, gold remains. Bangle goes away. All the various things made of that gold goes away, but the gold remains. Yes. Pure intelligence. Transcendent Brahman that remains unchanged. That has been referred to as pure intelligence. Modifications are but names and forms. Vacharam Bhanam Vikaro Nama Dheya. That is Chandogya Upanishad. Vacharam Bhanam. Your effort of speech is all name and form. Truth is the gold. That is the truth. Or earth, play is the truth. Pots and pans are names and forms. Vajaram bhanam vikaro namadheyam mrittiketeva satyam. Mrittika means earth. That alone is truth. The others come and go. They have a time. They exist. A time. They do not exist. But the earth remains. Yes. Another Shruti also says, this is real. My dear self, it is indestructible. The Atman is indestructible. Avinashi, va, are, I am Atma. The Atman is indestructible. There is nothing that can destroy the Atman. That is the great truth which is central to Vedanta. In the Gita also, the Atman, indestructible. No weapons can cut it. No fire can burn it. Beautiful verses are there in the Gita. That is the nature of the ultimate reality that peeps through our individualized consciousness. Therefore, this great, endless, infinite reality, already explained, is quite sufficient for knowledge. You say, oh my three. Later on, it will be said, for the knower's function of knowing can never be lost. The knower's power of knowing always remains. This knowing, that knowing may go, but the power of knowing remains. Fire, burning, that power remains. It may burn this, it may burn that, it may not burn at all. But power of burning remains. That's the nature of fire. A, a thing that is established according to one, na- its own nature. It can never be removed from that nature. That's the nature of a thing. So, bhavamna jahadisa. When you determine this is the nature of a thing, that nature cannot be removed from that thing. That's the dictum in science. Dictum in Vedanta also. So, bhavamna 
यहाँ आके था एंड सो क्या तुम क्या कंटिन्यूस टू एक्सप्लेन मोर एलॉबरेटली दिस ट्रूथ एंड दिस द मोस्ट फेमस पैसेज इन द उपनिषद यहाँ तदितर इतर पिघ्रति तदितर इतर पश्य तदितर इतर शुणोति तदितर इतर अभी वदति तदितर इतर मनुते तदितर इतर विजानादि यहाँ भूत तेनक पश्येनक जिघ्रेत केनक शुया तेनक अभी वदेत तेनक मनवीत तेनक विजानीयादानादि तम कें विजानीयाजातामरेकन विजानीयादिट द वेरी टॉप लेवल ऑफ एक्सपीरियंस एक्सप्रेस इन अ पर्टिकुलर सेंटेड द ट्रांसलेशन सेज बिकॉज व्हेन देयर इज ड्यूअलिटी एज इट वर देन वन स्मेल्स समथिंग वन सीज समथिंग वन हियर्स समथिंग वन स्पीक्स समथिंग वन थिंक्स समथिंग वन नोस समथिंग बट व्हेन टू द नोवर a brahman everything has become the self then what should one smell and through what what should one see and through what what should one hear and through what what should one speak and through what what should one think and through what what should one know and through what that's the question and then through what should one know that owing to which all this is known vijnataram are kena vina vijaniya that which knows everything what is that by which you can know that thing you can never know it you can be it you cannot know it vijnataram are kena vijaniya vijnataram means the knower vijnatara vijnana vijnatara how to know the knower ask the question yourself knower cannot be known can never be made an object of knowledge other things can be made objects but not the knower and shankara's commentary will say the i cannot see itself the i can see everything the i cannot see itself with itself with the power of seeing that power is always there so is it vijnata aramare kena vijaniya how can the knower be known it's not an object of knowledge an object alone you can know so we have these t these two data one is the object the other the subject in sanskrit they are called vishaya and vishayi beautiful technical terms shankara sutra bhashya begins with the statement of vishaya vishayi the whole of human experience consists of vishaya and vishayi subject and object but both are confused in experience by discrimination you find out what is the vishaya what is the vishayi that is the nature of vedantic inquiry viveka between vishaya and vishayi i am essentially the vishayi i am not a vishaya that is my true nature now when you deal with vishaya you have got multiplicity when you deal with vishayi you see only unity there is no second vishayi this vishayi knowing that vishayi is not at all there that is a very profound subtle truth that is what vedanta discussed and discovered ages ago and some great scientists today appreciate this wonderful conclusion that consciousness is always a singular there is no plural in consciousness if you see plural it is due to maya a deception says schrodinger nuclear scientist here is that high water mark of this investigation nature of consciousness finally you come to one infinite consciousness everything else is only manifestation through various media these medias are many consciousness is many really consciousness is never many consciousness is always a singular it has no plural it knows but nothing knows what is the knower himself how can the knower know himself that is the question vijnataram are kena vijaniya i understand you when i say what exactly is happening i understand many things about you objective things about you i never understand your consciousness because we have only one consciousness when i know mine i know yours because we are one that is the nature of all understanding of consciousness we are that not that we become we try to understand that we to know that we can be that 
Inner life is a profound truth. Outer life, you know things, because they are all objects. Inner life, we are dealing with the self, dealing with the subject. They have very step in knowledge, tends to be being. Knowing becomes being. You are that. That's what happens in all knowing. The other knowing is separate. This object, another object, another object. Doesn't become being. Knowing is knowing. But in the inner world, every step in knowledge tends to be being. Knowing becomes being. I am the self. I am the one. I am the infinite Atman. That knowledge alone you can have. Not that I know myself. I know this Atman. Atman is not an object. It's always a subject. Always a drip. Never a drishyam. As that famous book puts it. Drip drishya viveka. That is the companion book on Vedanta. Short book of 50 or 54 verses are considered to be very profound. The very first statement is on this subject in that book. Now, see the analysis. What wonderful thinking is there. It says, Rupam drishyam, Lovachanam drik, Tat drishyam, Driktu manasam, Drishya divrtaya sakshi, Drigeva natu drishyate. Rupam drishyam, Form is an object of vision. Rupam means a form. That is an object of vision. Rupam drishyam. What is it that sees it as a subject? Lochanam drik. The eye becomes the seer. The form which is the seen. That is drik. Drishyam. This is drik. In that particular context. Rupam drishyam. Lochanam drik. But lochanam itself becomes drishyam. To whom? To the mind. Tat drishyam. Drik to manasam. I become object. Drishyam. And the seer is the mind. Then mind itself becomes drishyam. Drishya dhivrutyaha. All the various movements of the mind are called ideas or concepts. They are all drishyam. Remember that. Drishya dhivrutyaha. Then, who is it that sees them? Where is the trip gone? Gone deep inside. The sakshi. The eternal witness of all the comings and goings of things. Sakshi is the sakshi drigeva. Always it is only drik and never drishyam. Nadrishyate. You can never make Sakshi the object of your seeing. This is the analysis from the external to the internal. That book itself is called Druk Drishya Viveka. Discrimination between Druk and Drishya. Seer and the seeing. So here we have come to that ultimate reality of the Druk. Druk which is always Druk. Never a Drishya. So Vijnata Ramare Yena Vijaniya. My dear how can the knower be known? What a profound level of thought it is. Knower can be experienced. I am that you can experience. You are that can be experienced. But not known as an object. It is never an object, ever the subject. This is the Atman. The infinite Atman is the infinite Sakshi of the whole universe. Everything that goes on is known by the Sakshi. The whole world, solar system, we speak of the sun as the sakshi of the solar system. Every event in this solar system is perceived by the sun, by his rays, by his various radiations. There is nothing unknown to the sun. So that is called eternal sakshi. Here things come and go. They die away. Mountains come, rivers come, they disappear. Everything happens. Everything is seen by the sun. That is the sakshi, vishya sakshi, we call the sun. So in this way, Taking the whole of the universe as a whole. Who is that seer? That eternal seer is the Atman of the nature of pure consciousness. Because it is pure consciousness, it is a seer. It can see, it can know, it can understand. That is where knowledge reaches its ultimate state, ultimate consummation. Infinite knowledge is the nature of Brahman. That is how Upanishad presents the ultimate reality in the Taitri Upanishad, saying, See the wonderful majestic utterance in that Upanishad, second chapter. Brahma Vidraapnoti Param, the number of Brahman attains the supreme. That is the first sentence. Brahma Vidraapnoti Param, Tadesha Bhukta. This is said about that. What is that? Satyam Jnanam Anantam Brahma. Brahman is Satyam. Brahman is Jnanam. Brahman is Anantam. Where is he? Far away? No. Yo Veda Nihitam Guhayam Parame Vyomanam. Realize him in your own self. 
Ever present there. Then you achieve everything. You realize Brahman there. Toshno de Sarvan Kaman Brahmanasa Vipashita Yati. That is how Taitriya Upanishad referred to this great subject. There is a uniformity of theme in all the Upanishads. Atma Egatta Vidya. Brahma Egatta Vidya is the text of all the Upanishads. Unity of the Atman. Unity of Brahman. There is no two. Neha Nanasti Kinjana. There is no two here. There is no differences here. Everything is one infinite Atman. That is the language used here. And the next word, the shloka, it will come. Vijnana Ghana. That word is used. Vijnana Ghana. The very essence of Vijnana. No foreign matter at all in it. The word Ghana is used in that sense. Vijnana Ghana. Atman is Vijnana Ghana. A mass of pure consciousness. That is the Atman. And that is the ultimate reality. The God we worship is that God. Infinite, mortal, non-dual. Because it is very difficult to understand, we can give it a form, even give it a name. And thus we have in religions so many methods of worship, bhakti, etc., etc. That is understood. Sadhakanam Chitarthaya Brahmano Rupa Galpana For Sadhaka's convenience, Brahman, which has no name, which has no form, we attribute a name and form for our sake of worship, and that is perfectly valid according to Vedanta. Sadhakanam Chitarthaya Brahmano Rupa Kalpana. If all this universe has come from Brahman, why not take an aspect of this universe and worship him through that? As a means, it is perfectly all right. That is why various types of worship, various types of divinities have been taken up in the system. They are all very useful for our spiritual development. Through name and form, you go beyond name and form. That's why we start with the form, we go beyond the form later on. Image worship is considered to be the very ordinary level of spiritual life. You have to go beyond the image to realize what is symbolized by that image, the symbol, and what is it of the symbol of. So symbol is used for that purpose. If you speak of, in mathematics, we say one, two, three, four, various figures we use as symbol. They are only symbols. They are not reality. Realities are out there. But mathematics, abstract mathematics, deals with symbols. And as symbols, they are perfectly all right. Don't run away with the idea. They are the reality. Reality is out there. One means one rupee. Or one this, one human being. Or two or three. But here is only abstract number. We are dealing with abstract number. So in all symbolism, we have the, the, the capacity to go beyond the symbol to the reality of which it is a symbol. So in spiritual life also, we are asked to do the same thing. This is a symbol. This is the divine for us. And we worship it. And we try to realize it in your own self, in the Atman, ever present in the heart of man. That is Brahman. To help it, we do this kind of worship outside. So this ultimate reality, when it was well established in the Upanishads, from that came the flow of various varieties of Sanatana Dharma, according to people's taste, people's capacities. Religion can be infinite variety, because each one of us has an individual identity. This suits me, that suits you. Have it. Any number of religions, there is no harm. As Vivekananda said, the more religions there are, the better. Because everybody will get what suits him or her. If only one is there, you have to twist people to suit that. One type of shirt. If it is a fat man, that shirt, that shirt doesn't suit him. We don't want it. We shall find a shirt that suits him. That is India's attitude. That's why diversity in religion, because of diversity of people. But truth is one. Egam Sat, Vipra, Bahutha, Vadanti. Whatever names you use, doesn't matter. Whatever form you use, doesn't matter. But remember, for the one infinite divine, you and I worship, that there's a harmony between this and between that. That kind of perfect freedom in the world of religion, India gave. No other nation has done it, only this country has done Absolute freedom. Because of this wonderful strength, it's all one. That one you call it by various names. Names only are different. Truth is one. What does it matter? You know the goal. Then make any argument out of the goal. Any shape you give. But, but remember, it is gold that you are handling. Value is there, not in the shape. In the shape it is only a Vahaic value. Paramartha value is only in the gold itself. So in this way, we were taught by great sages how to base our spiritual life on this most difficult subject, Brahman, transcendental, beyond name, 
beyond form, beyond conception, you cannot conceive of it. Yato vacho nivartante aprahapya manasasaha. Taitri Upanishad said, Brahman is that reality from which speech and thought recoil, not being able to comprehend it. What a wonderful language. Any subject in the world will comprehend it by speech and thought, by concept and by a word. This is a cow, a cow concept and a cow name given to a particular object. We understand things, we classify them, we do all these things to understand the world in this way. Language is helpful to you. Concept is helpful to you in every field of experience except here. In this field, language fails. Concept fails. Thought fails. That's nature of the ultimate reality. That's why this is going to tell later on. Shanto Yamatma. The Atman is silence. Why? That's the nature of the Atman. When you speak about it, you come down, far down, to explain what it is. Shanto Yamatma. That comes in the gate into gate. In all the great mystics, Chinese, Buddhist, Islamic, Christian, Hindu, Jewish, every one of them, you will find the ultimate reality beyond all specification can be expressed in speech or thought. That all accept that idea. So that is how the Upanishad presents this. So that it's not a matter of talking. The more words doesn't mean the more understanding. Words are confusing. Vacho viglapanam hirat is the sentence that recommends the Upanishad. Speech is only confusion of mind. Too much of speech is confusion of mind. That's language they will use there. So, language must be minimum. Concept must be minimum. Try to experience the thing. This is the language that has been current in our Sanatana Dharma tradition based upon the Shruti. The Shruti, particularly in this Upanishad, you find the finest, finest exposition of this wonderful reality of the Absolute, the Infinite the transcendental. Out of this, we built up popular religion for you and me. We are not strong enough. And the whole thing is part and parcel of the Tanatan Dharma. That's what Vivekananda said at the Chicago Parliament of Religions in a famous lecture. That sentence is marvelous. The scope of the Hindu religion. Till now we never understood the scope. Indefinably the Hindu religion, everybody used to say. But in that speech, he gave a certain kind of understanding of the vast scope of this great religion developed in India based upon the Upanishad. That sentence says, from the highest flights of the Vedanta philosophy, of which the latest discoveries of science seem like echoes through various ideas of idolatry, through the agnosticism of the Buddhists and the atheism of the Jains, down to the lowest ideas of polytheism, etc., each and all have a place in the Hindu religion. It's a wonderful sentence there. All this is based upon this wonderful truth. According to your need, according to your own mental capacity, approach the divine. There is no harm in that. But only go on understanding that unknown reality I am worshipping through this way or through this form. That understanding must come. That's why temple worship is also understood as an aspect of the divine. We have the concept of the image as a living reality of Brahman. The form of Brahman is in that image. We go for darshan, we say. Darshan is a beautiful concept. I can't see Brahman. I can see Brahman in this form. Or a holy man. Brahman in that form, we go and see. The word darshan means actual seeing, experience. Not merely conceiving mentally. That's why we go to temple to have a darshan. Have a darshan, come back. What you see there? That Brahman. Beyond name and form is available in this temple, in this form. Our whole devotion is centered there. That is why temple worship also became so very essential part of the spiritual education of the human being. The best expression of this truth is found in the opening verse of that great book, Narayaniyam, by that great Guruvayur devotee, Narayana Bhattadri. About four centuries ago, the book was composed, very popular English translation you get here, Narayaniyam. The opening verse is wonderful. It says, Sandrananda Babodhatnakam Anupamidam, Desha Kala Vatipyam, Nirmuktam, Nityamuktam, Negama Shata Sahasrayan, Nirpasyamanam, Aspashtam, Krishtamatre, Punaguru, Purushar Satmakam, Brahmatatvam, Tattavat Hadi Sakshat, Guru Pavanapure, Anta Bhagyam Janana. 
how fortunate are people that infinite Brahman, beyond name, beyond form, spoken of as not this, not this in the Upanishads, that infinite Brahman, which is the aim of our life to realize that very Brahman is present to us in this temple as the image of Krishna in the Guruvaya. How blessed we are. That's the language used in that book. That's why we have devotion to this kind of worship from the highest level to the most ordinary level of our own stature. You find a unity between one and the other. This is the education of the human being. If you don't understand that, become an agnostic or a thief. You don't say, no, you can take it little way. Just like strong man eats a good lunch, strong food be it. A baby, you give very light food, extremely light food, highly diluted food. That is the food of the baby. This is the food of the strong man. All must be fed. That concept applied to religion is what India experienced. All must be fed. But most ordinary people, they can't understand these big things. Even they can understand religion and God, etc. It's a wonderful idea. India alone has it. In all other countries, one single approach. Everything else is destroyed. No place for anything else. In the Islamic tradition, you have the concept of breaking away all idols. Every temple, Hindu and Buddhist, completely destroyed. Every idol in Mecca was destroyed by the Prophet. That is their approach. Jewish approach. Semitic approach. Only God, our God, who is somewhere in the sky, alone is true. All this is false. They are very strong about it. They have destroyed many. But one of the great Muslim poets, second volume of Eternal Values, the message of Muhammad in that lecture, saying, uh, an ordinary person was praying to God, God, I want to wash your hands, I want to wash your feet. As he was like an idolatrous person, he was doing all these things. Suddenly, Moses came. What? You are foolish. You are destroying the true nature of God. You are full of this idolatrous attitude. Like that, scolded him. At that time, the God's voice was heard. Moses, I did not send you to disturb the faith of an ordinary person. He has done it for my sake. He is doing it for me. You forgot that. That kind of wisdom was given to Moses by God in that particular situation. This is what is quoted in that famous passage by that famous Persian author. I forget the name just now. A well-known author. So I am telling, in other countries also, this tendency is there to understand human situation. All cannot understand the highest. Put it in the way they can understand. All cannot take very strong food. Put a very slight food. Make it very, very easily digestible so that they can slowly become stronger and stronger. That is the wonderful evolution of religion that took place in India from the time of the Vedas up to date, up to Sri Ramakrishna in our own time. Here we are dealing with the Mount Everest of experience. There is no duality. Bhavati. Where there is a duality, we can communicate. I speak to you. I am separate. You are separate. But everything is the Atman. Whom to speak? How to speak? What to speak? Everything is one. That infinite experience comes. That is what is described in this famous verse. 2, 4, 14. We have just finished it. We shall continue this subject next Sunday. This chapter. Then will come another great chapter of a great philosophical assembly in Janaka's court. Great scholars come. Yachnavalka appears once again as a great spiritual philosophical teacher. We shall get into this next Sunday onwards. Last Sunday we heard Yachnavalka's reply to my three when she had said, your teaching has put me into delusion that when you attain this immortal Brahman, you cease to be. You will lose your individuality. That has put me into confusion. Then he had said, no, it is absolutely no confusion. That individuality which separated you from others, that individuality has gone. But you are always there, the infinite Atman, that is our true nature. The particular has gone, the universal is always there. In that way, he said, and then gave that beautiful teaching, Yatrahid Dvaita Miha Bhavati, 
wherever there is duality as it were actually there is no duality but you think there is duality in all such situations you can see somebody talk to somebody all this you can do but when everything through knowledge of brahman becomes brahman then who is to talk to whom by what you can talk and in the end he said vijnata ramare kena vijani yat is a profound heights of thought how can the knower be known that is the question that by which you know everything how to know that there is no means at all you can be that you can't know that god is not a subject to be known as the eternal self of all it is through his power we know and see the i see the ears hear all this that's what kena upanishad has said shotrasya shotram manaso mano yat the atman is the ear of the ear the mind of the mind prana of the prana all energy behind all this is in the atman only that atman which is eternal seer cannot be seen cannot be known cannot be objectified that is the language very high level of thought you find in this particular utterance vijnata ramare kena bina vijaniya yenaidam sarvam vijanati that by which we know all this universe how can you know that that is the language we know the universe with our mind in fact as pascal said the famous french philosopher and mystic and scientist we understand the world by our thought that is our true dimension we are not a speck of dust physically we are but something in us make us understand this whole world there is something in us that is a language highly commended by prince louis de broglie quoting this wonderful statement by pascal so this in vedanta is a central theme that by which that by which we see the universe we know the universe how can that be known the knower is always a knower never a known It can never be an object the eternal subject trick that's the language used so this search for the eternal trick who sees eyes think i am doing it ears think they are doing it they are not doing there is energy energy behind it nervous energy like our own neural energy the energy thinks it is doing no it goes still further in this way we come to that which is the primary source of all knowledge of all power of all energy that is the infinite consciousness we call it chit shakti that infinite chit shakti we call the divine mother in our own language shakti of brahman the infinite shakti he is pulsing in you and me that is the power from which we get the power to see things and so the devi mahatmya sings या देवी सर्वूतेषु शक्ति संस्थित नमस्त 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 नमो नम सिमरली बुद्धि क्षाति दयाण मातृपेण दैट डिवैन मदर एक्सीस्टिंग इन इन दीज फॉर्म्स वी आर एबल टू सी दिस वी डू दिस एंड दैट सल्यूट है वी सल्यूट है दैट इज द डिस्कवरी इन इंडिया वन इनफिनिट प्योर कॉन्शियस्ने functioning through every one of us that will come towards the end of the next section that we shall deal with the day so here this is the crescendo of the statement vijnata ramare kena vijaniyat how can we know the nova impossible we are the nova that is why that language was used in chandogya sir who is the nova which is the nova Please tell. You say, Tattvamasi, Tattvamasi, you are the Nova. It's not some object somewhere there. You are that, you are that, you are that. There is a constant teaching in Vedanta. Objectivity 
is what you see outside. Table, chair, sun, moon, star, these are all objects. Who sees it? The subject. Who is the subject? That is the biggest search. That is the biggest search. And today's physical science is on that search just now. After knowing what the world is, they want to know who is the knower of the world. There's a great search is going on. In ancient Greece, 8th century BC, 9th century BC also, in that temple of Athena, Delphi, a few miles from north of Athens, they took me there, temple of Athena, and the place for Oracle, Oracle of Delphi, famous. And that oracle has given a wonderful motto, Man, know thyself. It is not enough, you know the world. You must know yourself. That wonderful teaching, only Socrates and a few others knew. And now the modern science is turning in that direction. Man, know thyself. And in India, that became the central theme in the Upanishads. Here we are finding out, where is that wonderful seer of sight? The knower of knowledge, where is that? Let us examine the body, the sensory system, everything. Even the mind, even the brain, even the buddhi, not one of them. They are all drishyam, objects, reflected light, make them see things. Like the eye has reflected light by which I sees. As soon as that energy is cut off, I have no power. So I is not a real seer. Then the mind, the buddhi, finally found that Atman, our true self. That is our true self, the self of all. That is how this knowledge came. And so, this completing this section, we is the fourth section, two, four. And now we enter into the fifth section of this particular uh, second book of the Pradharnika Upanishad. Here, in a series of verses, the Upanishad says, it's called Madhukanda, Madhu mean honey. This is called Madhukanda. Now, in this world, Everything is madhu to everything else. There is a mutual supporting system in this world. A generalized statement. That is particularly expressed in a series of verses. I just read the first verse. The rest are all dealing with similar objects. The sky, the fire, water, everything in the world, one by one is enumerated. But one text is enough to understand what is meant by this concept of mutuality interdependence called Madhukanda. I am your honey, you are my honey. I enjoy you, you enjoy me. So also the stars, so also the earth, everything enjoy each other. There is so much of interconnectedness. The word interconnectedness is a great word in physics today as well as in astronomy. Everything is interconnected. Just like a small thing happening here will be affecting the stars far away. There is so much connectedness. Only we can't measure them. They are so small, but it's always there. This is a famous theory developed in 20th century physics. The total interconnectedness of the whole universe. Now here is the whole section dealing with that. Madhukanda. Madhu means honey. There. Iyam prithivi sarvesham bhutanan madhu. This is 251. Asyai prithivyai sarvani bhutani madhu yascha ayam asyam prithivyam teju mayo amrutamaya purushaha yascha ayam athyatmam shariraha teju mayo amrutamaya purushaha ayam evasa yoyam atma idam amrutam idam brahma idam sarva This earth is like honey to all beings. And all beings are like honey to this earth. We enjoy the earth. The earth enjoys us finally. <laughs> the body is put there. So this is a, a universal proposition that everything in this world is interdependent. I enjoy you, you enjoy me. The whole world is like that. Then he said, the same with the shining immortal being who is in this earth and the shining immortal corporeal being in this body. The self of the earth, self in me. Self of the earth is not conscious as the self in me is. But we do see self is present there 
in every particle of dust, that self is there. So, these four are but this self. The self there and the earth. The self here and this body. All these are nothing but the self. This self-knowledge is the means of immortality. This underlying unity is Brahman, uniting everything as a garland by a thread, thread of being. This knowledge of Brahman is the means of becoming all. We become all through this knowledge because it is the all. In the first book we had read, Brahman knew all. How? By becoming all. When he became the whole world, he knew the whole world. As I often give the emphasis, the sun knows everything in the solar system. How? Sun is the solar system. Condensation of solar radiation is the solar system. Sun is the all-knower with respect to solar system. So, Brahman is all-knowing because he is the all. Sarvatnya is a sarvavit. Two words are used. Yes, Sarvatnya has sarvavit. He who knows everything generally and particularly. Two kinds of knowledge. He knows in general, he knows in particular. And because he knows everything, he is the all. The allness is the most important. The Brahman is the all. And when you are the all, you know everything. So becoming Brahman is to know everything. That universality is the, that means of becoming the all. The next is similar. This water is like honey. This fire is like honey. This air is like honey. One by one. It's coming in this section. Shankara's commentary is just translation, that's all. But there's not philosophical significance except this wonderful statement that this is knowledge of Brahman, which is the all. Then, this sun is like honey. These waters, disha, like honey. This moon is like honey. Lightning, cloud, ether. Similarly, this righteousness, dharma, also the same. Then this truth is like honey. This human species is like honey. Such a big language here. This human species is like honey to all beings. And all beings are like honey to this human species, etc. is the infinite one. This cosmic body is like honey to all beings. Going further and further, the cosmic body. Again, mutually helpful. This helps that, that helps this. Mutually helpful. Similarly, this self, I am Atma, Sava, Sarvesham Bhutanam Adhipatihi, Sarvesham Bhutanam Raja, Tadyata, Rathana Bhau, Cha Rathane Mau, Charaha, Sarve, Tamarpitaha, Evameva Aspin Atmani, Sarvani Bhutani, Sarve Vedaha, Sarve Lokaha, Sarve Pranaha, Sarva Eta Atmanaha, Apita, Samarpita. This self, already mentioned, is the ruler of all beings, Raja, and the king of all beings. Just as all the spokes are fixed in the nave and the fellow of the wheel, here is the nave, here are the spokes from the wheel coming, and it is fixed there. That's the language used here. Ara eva rathana pav, rathana bhi, the nave of the ratha, aras are all fixed there. But a whole system of wheel where they found to fix all the things, but that is the center. They are all are one. They are all different. It is one. As we say, God is described in one Christian mystics book as an infinite circle whose circumference is nowhere and whose center is everywhere. That is the definition. God is an infinite circle whose oh, circumference is nowhere, but whose oh, center is everywhere. Then what is the human being? The human being also is an infinite circle, whose oh, circumference is nowhere.